but I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. And now, welcome to another episode of Down the Rabbit Hole. Here's your host from FederalJack.com. It's Popeye. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another live edition of DTRH. It is October 27th, 2015. What am I going to be getting into tonight? Well, we're going to be getting into a few things. We're going to be going into Sellafield, which I bet people don't even know what Sellafield is. We're going to be covering CERN, geopolitics, and more wooery. Wait, now, did I say wooery? You all know here at TFR, if I say woo, that means there could possibly be only be one crew that could be hanging out with me. Well, there could be two crews, but the second crew, the Freaky Friday crew, is predominantly made up of ha- at least three quarters of it is made up of the current crew that I have on with me today. So what radio show host and his co-hosts could I have on to cover Woo? That would be the one, the only KBS. So let's give a big DTRH welcome to my good friends, Kev, Johnny, and Nano Girl. Welcome back, guys. Oh, and Popeye, you, it's been far too hey, long. Hey. Just thinking when I was listening to that theme music there, guys, we've done this once before with Popeye, and it really has. It's been too long, man. And it's uh, great to be back on Down the Rabbit Hole to continue the Woo Fest that started you t- over on you KBS. you talking about how long we've actually been waiting to go on or the hour-long intro? Yeah, well, I actually got a taxi up to your house, Johnny, woke you up, and they were raring to go. <laughs> That's what you meant by waiting to go on. You had to wait for the intro to get over first, and then you could get on. Smart asses. Leave it to Johnny. Oh, gee, uh, it's, the longest, it's the longest intro on radio. I've, I've been through all the oh. other stations in the world, and there's not one that lasts that long. I can test that. Mr. Everard, our good friend, he definitely has one of the longest ones also, Johnny. Oh, I forgot about that, Kev. <laughs> but this is funnier than Popeye's. But Popeye, how are you doing? It's your show, man. Where are we going? <laughs> I'm just enjoying <laughs> the three of you. Anyway, we're going to be all over the place tonight. Um, first, I figured since this is like the number one thing in my mind, I would cover this immediately and then we can get into like geopolitics and CERN and wooery. So, first things first. I want to you know if you guys over there in the UK, and Nano, you might be able to, you might have heard this too, you might be able to uh, comment on this, but have you ever heard of what Sellafield is, Kev, or Johnny? Ah, uh, yes, I certainly have, and Johnny will have undoubtedly heard of that place as well, with your uh, strong feelings on this issue, Johnny? Yes, it got to get ready, Kev, Trident, no use. What exactly is that? All right. Well, Sellafield was a nuke facility over in the UK. And I don't know. I didn't get a chance to actually Google map it uh, to see where it is on the map. If Kev, if you want to look it up, you or Johnny can on Google Earth while we're chatting. And you could probably give the listeners, since you know that area way better than I do, a better idea of where it's located physically. But uh, Sellafield, it goes back to the 50s. And there's actually, I can drop a link into the chat room. It's from The Guardian. And I'll I'll tell you a little bit about it. It says, um, one of the the number one pile caught fire in October 1957. And it was hushed up so well that even, I'm reading from the article now, that even with 11 tons of uranium ablaze for three days. let Let me say that number again, in case people aren't clear. 11 tons of uranium ablaze for three days. The reactor was close to collapse and radioactive material spreading all over the district. The people who work there were expected to keep quiet and carry on making plutonium for the bomb. Most people don't even know that this was going on over there. And it's the worst accident, apparently, in your nuke history. And nope. Outside of Chernobyl in Europe, this is about the only one I've ever heard of, Popeye. And yeah, Sellafield, the whole nuclear issue. I mean, just listening to you there, some of the stats, I wasn't aware of just how bad this actually was. I must admit that. And it just shows you how 
hidden this information was from people even in the UK at the time. And Johnny, what do you know about this fire that Popeye's on about? Actually, it's the first I've heard of the fire, Kev, but it's not the first uh, that I've heard of anything going wrong with these plants. We've got Doon Ray as well up here, Kev, and there's some strange things that have happened there as well. When there's been loads of... Um, the army, the fire brigade, uh, do you know what I mean? It's there, but you never ever get a story coming out from it. That's the thing. You never ever hear about the story of what actually went wrong. But uh, there's loads of things go wrong with these places, especially here in Scotland. It's amazing that you guys, and you guys are awake, you know a lot of stuff, and it's amazing that even living there, you guys have never really heard too much about it. I mean, 11 tons, the, the reactor was melting down, but they... There, I mean, 11 tons of uranium on fire for three days, and nobody, n- nobody said anything? Yeah, nobody, incredible. I mean, and no, to this day, where is the news about it? And the reason this rem- I, I bring this up is because since you guys were on, I, wa- I, I was looking and you guys were coming on, I was like, hmm, I wonder, wonder what happened in uh, UK's nuke history. Because I'm actually doing... A, a special broadcast next week all about the ongoing... I don't know if you guys have heard about this West Lake landfill problem over in St. Louis. Yes. Okay, yeah, well, the, the, for the listeners that don't know, the Manhattan Project? Yeah. The, the nuclear waste from the Manhattan Project? Yeah. They buried it in pits that weren't lined with anything. They just dug holes, threw this crap, and bulldozed it in, in 55-gallon drums, and threw dirt on it. That's how they handled all the original the oldest nuke waste we have in our history here in the United States. And it's still a problem because now it's buried in this landfill, right? And it's a twofold problem. A, it's buried in this landfill and it's leaking. Part of that problem is they build a housing community right next to said landfill. So that's a problem. The other problem is next to the landfill where all the nuke waste is, is a regular landfill where they had no regulations over what they dumped in there. So for years and years and years, they dumped everything from like, you, you know, car batteries to household debris to construction debris to everything. Well, that is on fire. It's currently burning right now as you and I talk. It's currently burning and on fire. And this underground fire is working its way towards the nuke waste dump. So it's a twofold problem. A, you have a fire at the waste dump. And actually, it's threefold. You have a waste dump, a regular waste dump that's on fire that you live next to. Next to that is a nuke waste dump, which in, by itself, even without a fire, is a problem and you shouldn't be living next to. And then, of course, there's three that the waste dump that's on fire is the fire is headed towards said nuke waste dump. So there's that. So because of that, and that's a, been a main focus for the past couple of days, uh, of what I've been looking into, I knew you guys were coming on, and I was like, I wonder what the, the nuke history is over there. And you guys have Sellafield, amongst other issues, but that seems to be the biggest thing that you guys have over there. And I thought it was interesting, because I was like, let's see if they... And I wanted, to, I wanted to see if it had been hidden from you guys, so that's why I didn't really tell you. I just said, hey, Kev, you know, if you, you know anything about Sellafield, I'm going to bring it up tonight. That's all I said to you. You did, and it was right before we came on, so it wasn't like you really had time to prepare or anything. And you guys, neither one of you, like I got your real general reaction. That's what I wanted. I wanted to see if the nuke industry was just as powerful over there at covering their asses as they are over here. And apparently the answer is yes. Nano? Well, I mean, are we surprised by that? No. Um, I wanted to throw this out there on uh, Westlake. I was listening to an update on them today. I think last night they actually had a town meeting with the EPA. Oh, yeah. And, and it was bursting at the seams with people. And the, the scary thing, Popeye, is there's no solution. Nobody is coming up with a solution of what can be done. Here's the solution. Everybody needs to pack their crap and, and, and get move. out of there. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and then that's the first step. Everybody needs to move. And right. then you can figure out litigation and what you're going to do about your house and about stopping the fire. But the residents need to move. There's your answer. There's, there's no other option. You can't. Well, I'd like to stay in my house. You can't. Everything is covered in radioactive particles. Everything. They're picking it up on the plants. They're picking it up on people's plants in their gardens, in their front yard, on their grass. Dude, it's done. 
You yeah. need to get out of there. You need to think right. about your health first and get out of there. I mean, isn't that what you would do? Uh, yeah, because I, I know what I know. Well, <laughs> I, I'm living in California, and here I am. I don't know. Uh, I'd like to think I would, but yeah, I think the the thing that scares me is something that uh, nobody's talked about, and I know you've listened to a lot of shows like this and done a lot of work on it. What happens when this fire reaches this 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 field? Is it is there going to be an explosion? What happens when point A hits point B? Well, see, the problem is if we knew exactly what was buried, we could make better predictions. But since no one really knows what's buried where and the government's not being very forthcoming, although the government keeps records in triplicate, so there's got to be records somewhere. And when they fill landfills and stuff, they lay it out in a grid pattern so they know, like, you know, this is house debris, this is where this went. Everything is logged. So... They're, and the way the government, come on, you're going to tell me they don't have, they don't, I have a feeling they know what's there, they just don't want to tell anybody. But to answer your question, I guess if everybody knew what was there and where it was, we would have a better, and where the fire was. See, they need to do, uh, I, I spoke to Radchick, Christina Consolo, about this, and her and I were conferring over this, and she said, they need to do ground penetrating radar, and I wholeheartedly agree with her, and it's not like they don't have the technology and satellites to do this. And they need to see, they need to focus it over the area, and they need to, A, figure out where the nuke waste is, if if, if they can figure out if it's spread. B, at least figure where the large concentration of it is. And then C, figure out where the friggin' fire is and where it's actually burning, too. Because they don't know any of this stuff yet. And I saw that meeting last night. The EPA's answer to those people is, we'll get back to you with um, what we're going to do about the fire by the end of calendar year. What? The end of calendar year? You mean the end of the frigging year, like December 31st? How about this is a problem now, and nobody's talking about it? You, what, mainstream, I mean, you, a little bit on the mainstream, but it gets hushed up, and you know why? Because the nuke industry, that's why. Because the oh, yeah. scumbag nuke industry, I'll say it one more time, because of the scumbag shitheel nuke industry, they have destroyed this planet. And I'm not a hippie, I'm not a green piecer, I'm not running around hugging trees. This is a fact. Those people are evil. They care about only one thing, money. Yeah. You, could, you could also throw in Fukushima. Look at the state of that, which is pumping hundreds of tons of radioactive water back into the Pacific. There's parts of the Pacific where fishermen are saying it is absolutely dead for miles and miles. We've got things washing up in beaches that shouldn't be here. We don't know if they're actually running into these uh, currents of radioactive water that's running into our shores. People here still haven't heard about Fukushima, never mind Sellafield. It's incredible. How do you keep that from so many people? And have you seen uh, Luke Radowski's uh, YouTube's the last couple of days? He's over yeah, there. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. And he, when he was, uh, he was getting bombarded by radiation. He said, "I, I have to yeah. get out of here j- just now." It's incredible. And they're going to hold the Olympics over there, eh? Oh, fantastic! Wasn't it? And didn't his little Geiger counter almost go up to three hundred or something? And I mean, that's just like off the charts. It was really yeah. high. Yeah, it's it okay because really the, the EPA sent him a text message to say that for the next hour we've raised the safe levels. You'll be okay, Luke. <laughs> here's some here's some um, um, iodine pills. It's all good in the hood. Oh, she went there, Popeye. She went oh. there. Well, what? It's only going to protect your thyroid. It won't protect any of the other. Oh, Popeye. <laughs> Believe me, oh, I, I know. know. I'm being I know you do. really It's just quite topical sarcastic. at the moment, Nano. On the hangar, we discussed this the other night, and okay. Joe, he went off his head because of things like iodine and snake oil salesmen and things like that, just <laughs> without even knowing it. You just sink. <laughs> well, it's, oh my God. It, it's, unfortunate. it's unfortunate because, like yeah. Johnny said, most people don't even know what Fukushima is. Every time I do a show... With Christina, and we discover we we discover we discuss um, Fukushima. I always say to her, one of the things I constantly hear when I say <clears throat> Fukushima is Fuku what? Fuku mm-hmm. Fuku where? Fuku who? No one knows what Fukushima is, a- and that's scary because that that thing is still ongoing. You could say to somebody Chernobyl, and they don't know what it is. 
I mean, and that's, I mean, I know it happened like 25 years ago, but still, that's, that's history. That's something you should, you, you know, you'd think you'd learn about. Mm, not, I guess it's not in the textbooks. Apparently, neither is Sellafield. I mean, it happened in, what was it, 50, let me go back and look at the year on the article here. It said it was 57, so 1957, and you guys don't know about it. A lot of the younger generation that weren't around at the time of Chernobyl probably might be even forgiven for thinking that it's a fictional town in one of the biggest computer games called Fallout. Because that'll be the only time they've heard of somewhere like Chernobyl Popeye, and that's because they are cult. They hide all this information because of the power of people like the atomic agencies. And in the UK, we've got the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority. Now, when one of these transporters or whatever you want to call it is actually moving uranium or any other of this nuclear equipment about Johnny Whistles, if you've ever seen this, Popeye, it's like something out of Delta Force. It's military precision. And it shows you the power that these people have because they shut down roads and highways and they do whatever they want. The power that that organization and that agency wields is quite frightening. And I bet a lot of people have never even heard of it. I've never heard of it, but I knew you guys had to have some version of the, uh, like the NRC or something. But I remember when I was in the military and people would say it was actually quite a good option when you got out to go and join. It was almost like the nuclear police. It was the Atomic Energy Authority security force. But see, trying to get into something like that, you'd have been as well trying to join the special forces. Well, I don't mind them having security for it. Or, you know, I, I, and I get them shutting the roads down because you wouldn't want some idiot, you know, careening through a red light and hitting one of those trucks. But, I mean, think about that. They're, what are they carrying in said truck? And exactly. just so we're clear, I've discussed this before. There's something called, uh, it's got the name, the Wigner effect. It's named after the scientist that discovered, uh, you know, the problem. And it's basically radiation's effect on everything, like construction materials, steel, you know, the body, but more so like materials. And if it's being transported in something, just remember this. As I've said before, there is no container that can hold all that radiation in forever. So you have to ask yourself, how old are those container trucks that they're using? And how many times have those container trucks been used and irradiated? And how weak is the metal? Is it breaking down? Is it actually leaking radioactive material? And, you know, just as it's coming through your town, it's driving through your town. They might have the streets closed down and they might be moving at 25 miles an hour. But what happens if it's a moving microwave? I mean, you have to really seriously take this stuff into account. The best thing, if you want to learn about Wigner, go over to YouTube and go check out Radchick's YouTube channel. She's got an entire playlist all about Wigner where uh, she did an interview with Lorraine Murray. Uh, another amazingly intelligent lady, and uh, it's a uh, it's a huge. I think it's like a thirteen part playlist, and she goes over all these different cases where you can see uh, Wigner's effect on like airplanes and other things. So go check it out. It's called the Wigner effect slash Loren Murray, and it's over on Christina's YouTube channel. Just look up Rad Chick R A D space C H I C K over on YouTube and look up the Wigner effect. And Lorraine Murray, she does some really, really good work. She really does, because I've seen a few of her interviews before, Popeye. But yeah, this whole nuclear thing, I mean, it's... uh, Where do you start with it? Because it's a genie we shouldn't have let out the bottle, but unfortunately, we did. Yeah, and and the thing that's really scary about all this is we really do have our heads in the sand about it, Popeye, as you know. I know you've done lots of good shows on it i know rad chicks have been bashing their heads against the wall trying to get this information out but um it's the thing that i think just watching luke over there because here's somebody here's somebody that you watch do all these youtubes and then he goes into a place we've all heard about he's got a mask on he's but which isn't even strong enough for all, all what he's doing and he's breathing fast and he's he's uh, he's, you can tell he's just kind of freaked out it's like we can only be here a short time we got to get out of here you know and that's and none of us are away and then these poor people go to this stupid meeting and the epa 
just like, oh, yeah, well, we'll get back to you. And it just reminds me of New Orleans and Florida. Florida also had the Corexit stuff sprayed all over it and all the other poisonous stuff that's happening all over our planet. And, you know, we always come to the same conclusion at the end of every discussion. What planet do the powers that be live on? Do they not breathe the air? Do they not eat? Uh, uh, you know, sometimes you do think if they've got some Elysium-like space station waiting. I know you really do, but you know the EPA—they're probably given healthy backhanders from the nuclear authorities because in the UK and somebody who's on this network. And if you're looking for a conspiracy, I tell you, here's one to look into with at much danger to yourself if you go too deep. May I add? But Christopher Everard speaks about the mafia and their connections to the nuclear industry. Now, how does the mafia tie to the nuclear industry? Well, there's a lot of money goes into getting rid of nuclear waste. Now, if you can get somebody to get rid of that more cheaply for you, and you get people like the EPA or the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority to turn a blind eye to barrels leaving the country, well, there's a big black market for people like the mafia and other shady organisations. And Christopher Everard he will tell you about barrels, thousands of them being dumped in the Mediterranean and all of that on the cheap. Like I say, probably backhanders going to people like the EPA. But Popeye, never a conspiracy short on the Kev Baker show, eh? Well, it's one of the reasons for the Somali pirates. Most people don't know that, but their fishing grounds have been poisoned by radioactive waste and other industrial waste thanks to the British government. And because of that, their fishing waters have been poisoned. You poison someone's fishing waters, you take away their, their way of surviving. What, what do you expect these guys to do when all there is to do in that area is fish? What, what do you expect them to do? What, I mean, really, what, these, these idiots, with, they know what's going to happen. And it creates more of a problem. Oh my God, now we have piracy again on the high seas. We have to send the Coast Guard and the Navy in to go fight. Mm. What you've actually got is coastline communities that are literally dying, Popeye, because their source of food and income, it's now gone. And it makes total sense that these people would get pissed and take to doing something. So, yeah, that, that makes total sense there, man. And people need to look into this kind of stuff because if it's going on over there, well, where else is it going on around the planet? And, and by the way, it's no surprise that the mafia is involved in that. The mafia uh, has always been involved in, like, trash. So taking away waste wouldn't be anything new. But they don't, they don't dispose of it properly. They're just putting it in pits or throwing it into the ocean. Oh, and by the way, you know who's running the cleanup over at Fukushima? The Japanese mafia, the Yakuza. You know where they get a lot of the workers from? They, people that owe them money and can't pay? And guess what? They get re they, they their life gets changed. They get just picked up and brought over and get told you're gonna you're gonna work your dead off here at Fukushima. Of course they're gonna die from the radiation exposure, but hey, they don't care. Serious, true story. Oh, and they're also rounding up homeless people. Yeah, that's, that's that the other way. Right. Rounding homeless people and taking them to Fukushima. Real Unbelievable, nice, right? really. So look at the, the the fifty people that actually went in there first. They knew. They knew Heroes. they were going in there to die. Yeah, and it's incredible, and nobody talks about them guys. You know, it's kind of like if if I'm I'm old enough to remember a when Chernobyl happened, and uh, you know all of the stuff that went on. It's so reminiscent of what's going on in Fukushima. Oh, uh, well, I think Fukushima is on like Chernobyl on you know steroids, but. The people, the brave people that went in and that stayed there and that had to fight that and, and get cover and try to save the people around them. I mean, ugh, what a nightmare. That, and, it, and it's still bad around there. It's still bad. And the people that died. You, you That's amazing. A lot of people don't even realize that. They, they'll think that you know, all of this isn't interconnected, but it is because this waste doesn't go away. Dumping the waste doesn't make it, like, it's not like dumping your trash. Oh, I got rid of the trash. I got rid of the garbage, Kev. I threw it out. I, I, I threw my bag of trash out, and look, most of it broke down over time. Well, I guess... Johnny took it out in the bucket, man. He got rid of it in the bucket. <laughs> Radioactive <laughs> material breaks down. The problem is it takes a couple billion years usually to do so. So, yeah, there's that problem. Stay tuned, ladies and gentlemen. We will be right back three short minutes. We are back, ladies and gentlemen, so I want to get right back into it. So, 
we were discussing Sellafield and Fukushima and all these different nuke accidents. And the reason I bring it up is because it's imperative that people pay attention to what the hell is going on. Uh, it's crazy out there. And, you know, the sooner we pay attention and we're aware that there are really, really horrible things like nuke waste dumps buried all over the place and that people, they're not told. The federal government knows they're there. They're just not telling you. I mean, think about think about that for a minute. They let them build a housing community, like a subdivision, right next to this nuke waste dump and didn't even tell them it was there. The federal government obviously knew it was there. And they didn't say anything. Think about that. And it's important to point this stuff out to show that there's a pattern of them not caring because some people, depending on, uh, and it doesn't matter which, uh, you know, which area. It could be Westlake. It could be people uh, out in Las Vegas because there's a fire going on out there at a nuke waste dump. It could be, it, it could be anyone that's invo- um, involved or affected by one of these events, and it, not just those two, anything else leaking that might think, well, the government will take care of it. I mean, the EPA, they're saying it's okay. Unfortunately, there are some people, uh, like over in Westlake right now, that think they actually buy the government what the government's saying, and they say, oh, oh but the EPA, they, they wouldn't lie to us, right? Unfortunately, I wish that statement were true. I honestly do. I really do wish that the EPA wouldn't lie to us. Unfortunately, that's not the truth. It's not. And they'll lie, they'll lie through their teeth. I mean, right after um, 9-11, a couple days after 9-11. What did they say? The air is perfectly fine to breathe. There's nothing wrong with it. Years later, we know that that was a lie. Christy Todd Whitman's been taken to task for it, although she was never really reprimanded and there was nothing ever done to her for lying and causing the death of people, which that's what that led to, or the Bush administration, because they're the ones that pushed her to say it. What about all the dust at Ground Zero? What about that? Oh, it's okay to breathe that, yet we know they lied now. All those first responders are dying or are already dead. We lost more first responders to illnesses since 9-11 than we lost on 9-11. But the air is safe to breathe, right, EPA? Right? So just take that into account, ladies and gentlemen. And yeah, I get a little passionate, but it's not directed at you. I care about you people, and I don't want you getting lied to. Because you are. Unfortunately, the government doesn't have your best interest at heart. Well, you look at some of the things. There was a, a nuclear dump found in Alaska. This was a few years ago, Popeye. Now, it took them forever to get this thing under control. What they done was they put this kind of an ice wall around it. And it took three years for it to settle down to a manageable level. Now, this is in Alaska. Now, this is a story that they were going to come out with when they said that they were going to fix Fukushima. They were going to put an ice wall around it. Now, if it takes something which is minuscule in size comparison to Fu- Fukushima, three years to settle in a freezing cold place like Alaska, how long would it take this ice wall to, to work in Fukushima? And this is the story that they were giving out that was going to save everything. It was, it's, it's crazy. I, one of the things I want to go back to what you were saying, Popeye, and I don't want that to go by without adding a few things, that I think at this point we have to assume that really we're just here for their amusement and for them to harvest everything they can from us. And I, uh, so, it's a word that Catherine Austin fits used a lot in her last interview and I really like that word because I find it an empowering word for me in the sense of she said we can't afford to get mad anymore like like to be to be in our anger but we need to be in our solution which I know you've said a lot and I love the word harvesting and it's it's like it it sort of freezes up and you think to yourself Whatever you do, if you buy a cell phone, if you uh, move somewhere, buy a house, like you said, go to the meeting, you need to leave that meeting and say, if I stay here, am I going to be harvested or do I get the heck out of here? You know, and you start to ask yourself a different question and whether we like it or not, we start to make our own decisions. They're not going to take care of us. They don't care about us. I I think they just look at us like giant pieces of, of 
pains in their butt. And we're there for their amusement and collect money and to do what they think they want to do. We're just like cattle. So we have to take our power back. And I think more and more of us, that's the only power we have is to take our power back. And that's why knowing about this stuff yeah. is part of the answer. Agreed. You know, and, you know, again, if I was in a situation where if I was down in Westlake or anywhere and I found out that there was a nuke waste dump right next to my house, I'd leave. I mean, I understand that it, the logistics of such a thing are hard, but right. if you don't leave, the the obvious will happen. You will get sick and you will die. So, it, you know, it's a matter of survival at that point. And then, you know, if... Eh, I, the only way that would really work in anyone's favor is if every, everybody has to do it together collectively and move out in mass. And it's hard. It's, it's a scary thing to do. But if people do it, I really think that that will help them because it would make a, it would, it would make a, a, it would make a huge statement. It would garner a lot of attention. And it's going to be pretty hard to ignore a couple hundred families who up and leave and turn a neighborhood into a ghost town, which would then create a vacuum and cause a problem like they'd have to send cops over there to keep the whole place safe during the day and at night just to prevent break-ins and looting because people would know that there's nobody there. The word would get out. So, what a great advert for Agenda 21, eh? Right. Seriously. You know, yeah, it just, I mean, it just sounds like that. As you see, everybody just moving away, do you know what I mean, leaving vast swathes of land open. It's uh, Agenda 21's dream. What if they know that the, because like, or at least in their eyes, they see like with Chernobyl, nature starts to come back. It, sometimes it's mutated and quite often it's mutated, you know, flowers, stuff like that, plants. But what if, what if that's their, that's one of the ways they get Agenda 21 pushed in? You have We these- know Popeye that by planting things like hemp, one of the best antioxidants in the world within 10 crops, if I remember rightly, somewhere like Chernobyl, that cleans the land, that actually lifts the radiation out of there. So there's solutions on the planet right now, albeit we're not really allowed access to them most but, of the time. But here's, here's the problem. What do you do with the hemp? Because now the hemp is radioactive waste. Give it that, to the mafia. See, the, most people <laughs> don't realize what radioactive waste is. When people think they think of radioactive waste, they think of like green goo and all of that. Uh, and I actually asked Radchek one day, I said to her, what is nuke waste? I, I know this sounds like a dumb question, but what exactly does it consist of? And she explained to me, it consists of not only like the, the fuel and the spent you know, fuel rods and all that stuff. And you know, the stuff that like in our minds, we always see on TV and stuff. It's like green goo inside of a 55 gallon drum. But that's not what nuke waste is. It's everything. The, the tools that were used to work on the reactor while it was in operation. Well, the reactor gives off radiation. Everything around there is irradiated. So the suits that the guys are wearing, the boots that the guys are wearing, the you know gloves, goggles, whatever, any protective gear, their tools are only useful once. Once you bring them into that area, they're now radioactive material. You can't keep reusing them because they're now radioactive. They could kill you just as bad as the, the, you know, the crap that's inside the reactor itself. So all that stuff, the, anything, if there's a, a mess, a cleanup, anything used to clean it up, shovels, anything. They sent like robots into Fukushima. They get like, you know, like ro- literally robotic drones to go in and try to clean it up. The radiation levels are so high, it fries the computer inside the robot. Well, guess what? That couple thousand dollar robot is now radioactive waste. And the problem is you can't do anything with this stuff. There's no safe place to store it. It doesn't matter. There is no safe place to store it. You put it in the earth. Well, what happens if you have uh, an earthquake? Or over the course of time, it's going to leach out because you're going to get groundwater that goes through there. There's, there's no safe, easy way to get rid of it. And over the course of time, no matter what you put it in, the radiation that's being given off by the radiated material breaks down the container it's in, i.e. the Wigner effect. It's this ongoing punch in the face, boom, 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 boom. 
And it's great because there are solutions like yeah, you, know, you can use hemp to pull the radiation out of the soil, which is awesome. But then the problem is you have radioactive hemp that you still have to do something with. So we have to figure out a way to get rid of the radiation itself. And I mean, it, like, you know, if you have radioactive waste, you have to figure out a way to actually get rid of it and not just, you know, you, you can't just have all this crap. I mean, we're building every day. They build new reactors somewhere in the world and they're making more material. But we still obviously have a problem with the waste from the Manhattan Project. Do you, you see, like, the problem there? There's, we don't know what to do with it. That's the biggest issue. And you know, Popeye, we really don't know what to do with it to the extent that they're trying to think of technologies maybe to offset the world that is going to be not too distant in the future. And what I'm talking about is we often mention a character called Dr. Craig Fentner or Vetner over on the Kev Baker show. And this is the guy who cracked the human genome. Now, you take that work that he was doing there and we connect it usually to somewhere like CERN and an interdimensional army. But let's think of this DNA tweaking because he was making a presentation to NASA and it was about dealing with radiation in space. Now, he was saying that they could take the DNA from an insect on Earth, that part of the DNA code that allows this, whatever species of insect this is, when it's bombarded with radiation, well, the DNA, it can repair itself. So, Popeye, they say that the only things that will survive after a nuclear holocaust would be a cockroach. So could it be that these cockroaches in power are literally going to take some DNA that's going to allow them to live through a radiated planet? And, of course, that won't be for all of us. That would just be the elite that would be getting something like that. Because it seems to me they have no intentions of cleaning this up for us or future generations. Maybe there really is Elysium. Right, maybe there it's really is a space right. you know, station that we don't know. I've often said myself, like, I don't know how they think that they can like get away doing this and letting this kind of crap happen. And that they're not gonna suffer from it. You you can't live in a bunker for how you know how many billions of years. Well, this is where this is where you start to look at CERN and the technology, and you start to look at the breakaway civilization, and you start to look at some other things that nobody's really talking about, and all the crap that NASA's probably really doing, but not really telling anybody they're doing. And you got to wonder what's really going on, because one of the things we're all pretty much watching is they're pretty much trying to get rid of all of us. There's just, I'm sure in their minds, there's just two doggone many of us, and they're getting more and more creative about it every day. They're not stupid. They're not going to live in all this stuff. They don't drink the poison water. They don't eat the poison food. They don't eat GMOs. They know better than all that. So there's got to be something going on. I think Elysium, it, again, another sci-fi movie. So or, or they do have access to a different planet that they can pretty much get themselves into and out of. And they have been for a while. Who knows what they've got? Or they do have access to the to changing the time and going taking the planet back to a time where it's clean and and changing some of the events that have happened. I mean, I don't know. They have so much stuff, so much access to stuff that we don't even have any idea. Well, but I can't believe that they would live in this filth. No, you I, know what I mean? I don't know how they could. I don't know how their body like they're not special. Right. They're not different no. from us. They're they're the same, you know. They're literal cockroaches. They well, can live in radiation. Their <laughs> their their physical bodies are still the same meat covered skeletons. Unless of course they really They're not. Like, <laughs> you know, they're gonna peel their faces off like Diana and V, you know. Well, we're going there early. We've gone woo early. Seriously. Oh, and by the way, I saw somebody in the chat had mentioned the Ronald Reagan. And they had stay, uh, they weren't sure if it was decommissioned or not. It's not decommissioned. It's actually still in service. And the Reagan was the new carrier. It's a brand new carrier. It's only a few years old. They sent that group, that whole thing, uh, the the whole fleet, the the Reagan uh, battle group, over there to uh, assist after Fukushima. That's right. And, and that the was whole a ship, disgrace that. Well, the ship is irradiated. Yeah. It's and the did, people did that she... jumped off of there first. Um, I'll, right. I'll bet you a few of them are dead. Oh, a lot of them are sick, and and or some of them I think have died already. But 
the two nasty things, and then I'll throw this to you, Nano, but two of the nasty things about that are, A, they had them cruising up and down because they knew they were irradiated, so then they had them cruising up and down taking radiation readings. They were using them like moving Geiger counters, basically, in the days after. So they kept getting irradiated. So it's not only the Reagan, but it's the other ships in that little battle group that were sent over there. But, wait, it gets worse. There's more. They switched, I think, I can't remember... I want to say it was the Enterprise that was over there in, uh, no, it wasn't the Enterprise. I think the Enterprise was in Hawaii. Like, whatever one was over in Japan, they just switched it. So now the Reagan is going to be berthed. Its home port is going to be in Japan now. So you keep the radiated ship and its radiated battle group over there. Wow. Where it got irradiated. Out of sight, out of mind. If people aren't, if that thing's not here setting off an alarm, because... Over there, they can control kind of who's going to walk around that ship with a Geiger counter. And it might be a little bit harder here, especially if they're close. Sometimes they have to sh- moor up and uh, dock in civilian ports. They'll, you know, you'll, they'll pull into like a, a major port. And like down in Miami, sometimes you'd, you'd see Navy vessels moored up where the cruise ships moor up right in the same spot. It's kind of hard to keep somebody further away with a Geiger counter from there. The, the chances that somebody could pick up radiation coming off the ship from there a lot easier than over at a military base in Japan, out of sight, out of mind. Absolutely disgusting. Go ahead, Nano. I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of curious because we have gotten absolutely no statistics at all on this uh, horrific event, but I'm very interested in how many people in Japan have been affected how many people, how many little kids are deformed? How many people have died? How long, um, did you ever ask the rad chick, how long, let's, okay, so let's talk about the Ronald Reagan. It's been ir- ir- irradiated. How long is that a toxic metal box, as it were? I mean, how Ooh. long will that be toxic? It all depends on what it was irradiated by and the half-life of the nuclear <laughs> material that, you know, okay. it was bombarded with, and that's all over the place. But you can't, it, it, what's worse is, she explained to me that, you know the pictures you see of the sailors scrubbing the decks? Yeah. Well, what that, and pressure washing the decks, that doesn't get rid of the radioactive particles. What it actually does is it pushes it further into the metal. Because the metal, uh, if, you, if you broke it down on like a molecular level, you see it's kind of porous. Right. And radiation starts punching holes through it. That's how it breaks it down. On a, on, a ver- on a molecular scale, that's the, the Wigner effect, right? So you have these holes being, it's already kind of porous, then you have these other holes being punched in it, and then now you have these deck crews and everybody going out there, scrubbing the deck, scrubbing the deck, scrubbing the deck, and they don't know. And what they're actually doing is pressure washing and scrubbing the radioactive particles further into the metal, further contaminating the metal, and further embedding it into the ship. So, I mean, as, as whatever the ship was hit with, whatever the half-life of that material is, is how long that ship will be irradiated. That's a, it's that simple. Anything is like that. You have a metal wrench, and you, 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 you know, you, it gets covered, let's say, in, in plutonium or, you know, or uranium. Whatever the half-life of either one of those materials is, and I can't remember off the top of my head right now the exact number, but I know it's, I think it's in billions of years, if I remember correctly, if whatever, whatever is exposed to that material and has that material on it or, and or in it now is basically has that material as part of it. So as long as that material is radioactive, that's how long the, the, the particular item, whatever it may be, will be radioactive as well. That's the problem with radioactivity. Pandora's box. And, and, and as to my statements about the statistics of the people of Japan, I know that they've been shut down. They're not allowed to say anything about anything. They have the Secrecy Act over there. You're not allowed to even talk about Fukushima. Right. I mean, look, honestly, if there's listeners out there, uh, if there's people in the UK that maybe know somebody over in Japan and they want to talk, send them our way. Tell them, the, you know, if you send, tell them, come talk to me. I'll have them, you know, talk to Ratchik, she's the right. foremost expert. You know, I'll, I'll give her. You can look her up over on Twitter. It's really simple. At Radchick Forecast. It's real simple. At 
the at symbol, R-A-D-C-H-I-C-K, the number four, C-A-S-T, Rad Chick Forecast. Follow her on Twitter. You can hit her up there. If you know somebody, send, send them their way or send, her, send them her way. Send them my way or Kev's way. We'll, all, we'll interview them and get it out. I mean, this, it's, it needs to be talked about. But the problem is it's the Secrecy Act. Right. If somebody talks about it over there, they can get arrested. It's like the Fight Club law. First yep. rule of Fight Club. Don't talk about it. Seriously, the first the first rule of Fukushima Fight Club is you don't talk about Fukushima Fight Club, or you'll end up getting busted into work in it. Seriously, for real. And then there's that's what it like, sounds like listening to you guys earlier on. I mean, Johnny, when he mentioned those homeless people, that's astounding. I'd never even heard about that. And I know it's wrong of me, but Fukushima's. I'm one of the people who has taken my eye off that particular issue. But every time I hear something coming out of there, you know what? It scares the life out of me, to be quite honest with you. Well, it's a scary thing. Don't don't give in to fear. But it's good to understand the reality of the situation. Because if you understand it, you look at things a little bit differently. And you start to reprioritize. That's why, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's thrown our way, at, you know, on a daily basis to confuse us and keep us not paying attention to what's really going on. You have to sort through everything and see through the garbage to see what's really important. You know, you have to... You've got to look past the trees to see the forest, Popeye. Well, it's like if you're shooting at a target and you have tons of distraction, you have to be able to look past the distraction and ignore all of that. Wait a minute, you mean those guns don't shoot themselves? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Don't even get me started. I know, man, I know. Bad bad thing to say, but, you know. Don't even get me. Uh, You'll sidetrack me. With all of the work that you've done on this, and I, uh, you know, like, I I should know better than I... I kind of tend to space on it. It's not like I don't keep up with it, but I, I, it's so overwhelming for me. Um, from all of the stuff and all the work you've done on this, Popeye, do you think that this is an extinction-level event? It could be. I'm not going to bullshit anybody. I've talked about this on air before. I mean, if we don't do something about it, yeah, it can totally. I mean, it's already really bad. Right. We're going to have to deal with this. It's altered our ecosystem. Let, let me ask you this. Why are the waters in the Pacific 90 degrees in October? Why are, why are they so warm? Oh, El Nino, El Nino and global warming. Oh, yeah, El Nino. Wouldn't happen, to, wouldn't happen to have anything to do with the radiation that's being spewed into the Pacific, right? Because radiation would artificially heat the ocean. What about all our dead fish, all our beloved dead? And this breaks my... I, I'll tell you, I, one of the reasons it's so hard for me to deal with this is... Obviously, the Pacific Ocean is gorgeous, and well, it certainly was. And whales and dolphins and all the beautiful fish and everything we have there—it's heartbreaking. You guys, there's no birds here. No birds. There's no birds. There's no birds. Okay. And we can thank the engineering people for that. I mean, well, think about this for a second. With with all the radiation, right, and all the stuff getting affected by that. Yeah. Yeah. Now have that in your mind, and keep the now keep that in mind, Nano, and think about this. What if? That same radiation that's in that water that's affecting the sea life is also heating, artificially heating the temperature of the ocean. Now, what just happened last week because the ocean water was 90 degrees in the Pacific? You mean the Cat 5? Yeah, the one that they talked about actually going up to Category 7 on the Saphir Simpson scale, like making two new categories for. Oh yeah, that one. The one that was the strongest recorded storm yeah. in history since they've been recording storms. Oh, but it's okay. It, it was just a, a bad storm. They they yep. they changed the uh, the rating on it. It's all right. Right, but that what? that's okay because that just shows you just how much that the <sighs> Pacific Ocean right now is fucking hot. Exactly. You know, you know yeah. that's actually a, a good play on word words, Johnny. It yeah, is. It is. Hot. It is fucking hot over there. And there's been a constant throughout tonight's show, especially over on KBS as well, but. CERN as well, guys. I mean, that's like yeah. harp on steroids. I'm not saying they directly made that hurricane, but it can certainly exasperate natural storms or Fukushima-assisted storms. We're so getting into that actually an hour or two. I want to pick everything up. all coming together, Popeye, isn't it? Sir CERN spurt. You're you're going to be the DTRH CERN 
spurt, Kev. Oh, yeah, he's, uh, he's got uh, that down. That seems to be the thing. I know. Quantum man. Quantum <laughs> man. I'm going to bring Quantum Kev on. There you go. Too. But, it, it, and yes, I know they can geoengineer storms, but, and there's probably a lot of, there was probably a lot of geoengineering going on, but now just add as a force multiplier something maybe pe- not many people, even the powers that shouldn't be, aren't taking into account. The artificial heating of the Pacific Ocean because of the radiation. What's going to happen as the water gets warmer? Right? What's going to happen? You've already been told this is going to be the worst winter that we've had in 50 years. And of course, they're dressing it up as El Nino. El Nino. And plus, it's going to be El Nino here. That's going to fix the drought if it doesn't drown us. Yes, yes, Such a bullshit. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned. Three short minutes. Hour one just flew right by. I love you guys, by the way. You know, I know the that's listeners cool, are that too. You guys know this, but I got to I gotta reiterate it no matter what. These guys and awesome lady are my family, and they know that. And we are actually really family. So anyway, stay tuned, ladies and gentlemen. I'll see you in three short minutes.